Hello everyone, my name is Benjamin Collins. I'm an application engineer with MCAD Technologies. And what we're gonna look at today is a review of our Keeping It Simple, Kissing Complexity Away SolidWorks simulation um, presentation from our 2015 Tech Days uh, that we did all over you know, our various territories. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the engineering acronym KISS, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And uh, what we find most often is that customers using SOLIDWORKS simulation software have a tendency to try to, as the saying goes, eat the elephant in one sitting. Try and do too much all at once. And what that ends up meaning is that you spend more time than is necessary trying to solve a certain problem. And so using a series of tools that we're going to talk about during this presentation, um, we're going to try and save you a bunch of time and still get the same results by asking very specific questions of our simulations. All right, so the model we're gonna look at today is this hanger assembly here with, uh, we'll call it a lamp hanging off the bottom. The point is, is that it's complex geometry with lots of curves and holes and features on it, right? So right now, it's the full model, nothing is suppressed, right? And if we take a look at the simulation conditions, we can look at the SOLIDWORKS model and see here, of course, I have my simulation uh, add-in turned on, right? And just like in the, in the 3D part environment, I have a feature tree built up of all the different connections. So I have materials applied to each of the different bodies in this assembly. You'll notice here I have an auto-converted toolbox fasteners box. See here I have a bolt and a washer. These are auto-converted features that were, used, that were created in the toolbox. So if you create toolbox bolts and washers and things like that, in 2014 and above, the software will automatically convert these into what's called virtual geometry, which is kind of fun because they're already virtual, right? They're in the software. But basically what it's doing is the idea that these parts don't have to be meshed. We're making some assumptions about them based on stiffness and, and just kind of general engineering assumptions um, to represent those parts rather than have to, uh, to mesh them. Then next up we look down at our connections. So that auto-converted toolbox fastener has created a bolt fastener feature. And in this feature here I could edit it and create any kind of axial loading, preloading situations that I want to set up, right? Next up, we look at our contact sets. Now, contact sets are an incredibly important portion of the software where when we're setting up our simulations, we need to determine how each part interacts with each other part, right? Are they bonded? Are they glued together? Do they have no penetration? So are they allowed to slide in contact with each other? Or do we have an allow penetration environment where they can, where we're basically assuming that they're not going to touch each other? One of the most common things that ends up happening here in the contact consets is that we don't have everything defined. So if we right click on here, this is a great tip, is using the contact visualization plot. Just like if we're using the uh, interference check and in the evaluate tools for assemblies, this can either calculate across the entire assembly or individual components. So we can go ahead and calculate and what it's going to do is color code various faces for what types of contact they're meshed for. So we see we have a no penetration down here and on the two sides. We have a bonded contact here in the middle. Now bonded contact obviously is like a most, the most perfect glue you've ever imagined. So this, you know, we're going to have to talk about the accuracy of that type of condition. However, the sacrifice we make for getting a more accurate contact type here in the no penetration region is that that's going to take longer to solve. But at least using the contact visualization plot here, we can kind of visually inspect and make sure that we have everything we thought we have, so that we have everything properly defined. Moving down, we're going to have our fixtures, all right? Now in this model, we have some fixture restraints just on the outside of these bar end cube pieces, right? Now a fixture restraint, of course, is going to take the tetrahedral elements that the software breaks the part down into. So you, if you imagine a three-sided, a four-sided pyramid, excuse me, um, you know, uh, not like the pyramids in Giza, but uh, three sides on top and one side on the bottom. Um, and it's going to take the nodes or the corners of that pyramid and fully restrain them in all six degrees of freedom. If you see these arrows here, 
there's an arrow with a disc on the end. All right. The disc refers to rotation about that axis, and the arrow refers to a degree of translation. Right. So a fixture restraint, we see three different arrows pointing three different directions and discs on the end of all three, meaning that the nodes on the surfaces of all these points are perfectly restrained. So it's not necessarily an accurate contact condition, but using St. Venant's law of um, finite element analysis, we can find that the inaccuracies caused by this fixture type tend to die off pretty quickly in the model. And so what we're going to find is that the area of question, the area that we are looking at, is going to be pretty far away from this inaccuracy, and so the results are going to be acceptable, they're going to be comparable. All right. Next up we have a load applied here, so we're just pulling down on this lamp per se. And if you see here we have a remote load applied, we can also apply a force. But if we look at this lamp, the way that any force is going to transfer through this system is go through the lamp, into the bolt that's holding it, up through the bolt, through the head of the bolt, down through the washer, then into the hanger, and up and then eventually to the local ground condition, like you're thinking about electricity, right? This is ground, this is downhill, where the fixture is, right? So any force has to flow over here. So what we've done is used a split line on the model, just drew a circle on this face, and used a split line to represent the area that that washer comes down on the face, and then applied this remote load to that face. So this is a simplification we can make, and I highly recommend it um, for you know uh, refining models. Lastly, here we apply a mesh control, and this is basically saying that you have a particular region that you want the mesh, or those tetrahedral elements, to be finer in a particular area so that you get more accuracy. Right? A finer mesh means a longer solve time. So we're getting a little longer solve time by meshing this region specifically, but we're getting more accurate results in that region, which is closer to our question. Right? All right. So I've got this whole thing set up, but let's actually talk for a moment about what the question is. So our question about this model specifically is what is the stress state of this fillet here, right? I could also ask what's the displacement state after it being loaded here, right? What is the stress state of different parts of the model? But my specific concern is whether or not this fillet is large enough, all right? This is what we're talking about is asking really specific questions of your model means that you have to do less overall computation and it means you can get results faster. Now maybe if you have more general questions about this assembly you might have to do additional simulations but again the time savings are going to add up. All right. So we're concerned specifically about the stress state of this fillet. And if we look at the results for this stress state, all right, we can see here that the results come out at approximately 3.867 megapascals. Right? That's the maximum stress encountered in this fillet, and in fact in the entire model. So we can see the fillet there. You can actually see the outline of the washer. And in fact, if you come over here and look, Really closely, there will be some perturbations right near the edge. This is the same finance law. But pretty quickly in, we get a relatively uniform distribution of force, which means that the St. Venant, the edge condition here with the fixture, has been dissipated so that now these are accurate results again, right? So we have a stress condition here. We can also look at its displacement condition, right, and see how far it's gone down based on that load. But we're actually going to end up sacrificing these displacement results in the name of faster stress results. All right, so keep that in mind. So we looked at this. We've got all of our different contact set situations set up. We've got our model ready to solve. Now, the first time you actually solve, it should be noted that we don't want to necessarily mesh it with us what's called a standard mesh the first time. All right? So if you imagine that tetrahedron we had drawn before, all right, we have points on the corners of our tetrahedron. All right? And those were restrained by the fixture restrained or had forces applied to them, whatever. But a second order element, which is what SOLIDWORKS uses for a standard mesh, 
actually has kinks in the sides of the triangle, right? So that the triangle can be squished in addition to translation. Well, that adds an extra degree of complexity. So what I highly recommend is that while you're creating the results for a mesh, I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to mess with these results, but I can take a look at this simulation here and show you very briefly, is that when I do the initial mesh for this structure, what I would like to do is come down here, turn on my mesh parameters, set it to a particular value, maybe leave this at normal, but come to the advanced and turn on a draft quality mesh. What this does is takes out the kinks in the side of the pyramid and reduces the degrees of freedom. So it basically makes it such that the pyramid can only translate, it can't squish. So you're losing accuracy in the model, but what you're proving is that the simulation will actually run to completion and that your contact constraints and everything have been applied correctly, which is incredibly important because we don't want to waste time determining whether or not the simulation is even going to solve before we attempt to get results out of it. Simulation, just like any other engineering tool, is a garbage in, garbage out type system, right? If you aren't aware of what it's telling you, SOLIDWORKS simulation can produce pretty colors all day long and not tell you a single answer, all right? But what we've done here is actually meshed all of these different studies you're gonna see at the same density, so the same size triangles, just to give us a good comparison because we're gonna make some assumptions to make this solve faster. And like I said, we're concerned about the speed that we get these results. So again, we talked about our contact constraints, but let's look at the speed here. The mesh itself solved in 11 seconds. We had 80,000 nodes or 80,000 corners of triangles. It's not necessarily directly the number of elements times four, right? Because a lot of internal elements are gonna share nodes where they intersect, right? So we have 50,000 or so elements, we have 80,000 or so nodes, mesh solved in 11 seconds. Well, the actual simulation itself, in this case, took 20 minutes and 47 seconds. Scale that up. It's 11 minutes, 20 hours and 47 minutes, right? This is a serious simulation run. And especially if you haven't done your draft quality mesh and all that kinds of things, you could spend 20 hours to find out that you don't have everything properly restrained. So let's look at a simplification we can make. The most complex part in this assembly is this lamp here at the bottom. It has all the curvy shapes. Every curvy shape is going to require smaller elements to accurately model that shape. And if we look at it further, there's not really a stress state in this lamp. We're not concerned about the lamp itself breaking. Our question is about the fillet on the hanger, right, where we see that max stress value. So what we can do is make an assumption and remove the mass from the, assembly, from the simulation. So in our first different simulation type here, I've got this additional simulation. It's a, basically just a different configuration in the model. And what we've done is taken this lamp body here and turned it into what's called a remote mass. Again, further simplifying the process, right? Basically, you just right-click on a part here. You can exclude things from the analysis, which is sort of what we're doing, but we're going to actually treat it as a remote mass. In this case, I'm acting on the hanger, but think of it as the, as the uh, lamp here. What I would do is select the part and then select what face that part applies its force through. So in the case of the lamp, the mass of this part, its force is applied through where the washer comes down, right? So I've set up that remote mass. Otherwise, everything else is the same. And actually, a really good way to check between different simula simulations if your results are similar is to right-click and duplicate the study. All right? And when you duplicate a study, you can use multiple different configurations, right? But basically, it's going to keep all of the settings the same between the two configurations and between the two studies so that you can make informed guesses between the two you know, informed choices between the two simulations. So the result on this one, let's take a look. We look at our stress, our stress results here. And we can see that the stress results come out at 3.885 megapascals, really close to our first simulation. All right? 
This, this tells us, as a good guess, that the assumption of making this lamp a remote load was a good one because it removed complexity from the assembly without removing the necessary information to find the stress state or to answer our question, find the stress state of this fillet. All right. Well, let's have a look how much that actually gave us. We take a look over here. We've dropped it down to almost 30,000 nodes, so 50,000 node savings, more than 50%, right? And it took two seconds to solve the mesh. Scale it up, two minutes, right? The solver message here tells us that we had only a minute and 30 seconds compared to 20 minutes and 47 seconds, right? So again, scale it up. This is all day or an hour, an hour and a half, right? So we took away that lamp. Well, what other pieces can we remove if we needed to? Based on the way this part is set up, where our question is located, these bar ends actually don't contribute that much stress resolution to this corner, right? So we can get rid of these bar ends as well, representing them as fixture restraints, again, using split lines on the bar itself to represent where these parts interact, right? So there's going to be a fixture restraint on these faces, just like there was on the bar ends, but now we're losing this, we're losing that piece as well. So we further restrained a degree of accuracy, right? Or excuse me, a degree of complexity while, con while continuing to maintain our level of accuracy around our question. Now I'll pose the question and answer it in a minute, but I'll ask you what of our three stress results, stress, displacement, or strain, are we sacrificing for the stress value by removing this piece and this piece. Let's take a look at our stress results. 3.906. The first one was the second one was 3.855 or something similar to that, right? So we still haven't changed a lot. In any simulation study, what's gonna be kind of our our criteria for convergence is gonna be that the results stop changing or don't change within about 5 or 10 percent. So 3.8 to 3.9 is pretty close. So basically what we've determined is that our assumption of removing the bar ends is still accurate. Once again, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Down to 17,000 nodes, right? Not as much as a reduction as last time, but a lot less. Mesh takes only a second to solve. The simulation runs in four seconds. All right, this is a minute Four minutes if we scale it up, that's a result in five minutes instead of 20 hours, right? This is a huge reduction. And as we saw, the results were very similar, all right? Now, I'll let you uh, think about it for a second. What was the major part, those bar ends, if you think back to our contact conditions, there was a degree of complexity in those contact conditions between the ends and the rod this was the major piece that reduced the solve time for this particular solution. And if we look at it, that was the contact constraints. Now there is only one set of contacts. It's a bonded contact between this hanger and the bar itself. Bonded contacts are much simpler to solve. All right. So as much as you can reduce the complexity of a a no penetration contact, the better, right? So let's say I had a water bottle sitting on a table. The surface of the table is much larger than the bottom of the water bottle, or say, you know, a small washer sitting on top of this whole bar. So what I do is use a split line on the bar to break up the face of the top of the bar so that I can mesh only the area I intend to interact with the washer as a no penetration contact, thus reducing the complexity that the software has to solve. Let's take some more out the window, all right? That bar in the middle was bonded to the hanger, which means that from the perspective of this bar, the hanger itself is not going to move, right? Not significantly. So we can remove that. 
From here on out, our simplifications are fairly aggressive, but we want you to know that they can exist. And of course, it's always the designer's responsibility, the simulation engineer's responsibility, to make sure that these assumptions are valid by cross-checking your results. All right. So we look here, we've got a fixture restraint there. There are no longer any contact conditions between different parts. There's a global bonded, bonded compact contact condition, which is just a default, but it doesn't actually have to mesh anything. All right. We have our external load, which is just our remote mass, right? And we can take a look at our stress results and see that it reports as 3.79, essentially 3.8. Remember, we were, we've been bouncing between 3.5, or excuse me, 8.5, 3.85, 3.9, 3.9, essentially. Right? So still very close to the same results. But once again, we can look at the results of this file and see that we reduce the complexity even further. At this point, this, the mesh is solving in less than a second, which is a, a feature of SOLIDWORKS. This only reports in seconds, so they do get shorter subsequently after this. And the solution time is only two seconds. So this is three minutes if we scale it up, right? One minute for the mesh, one minute, two minutes for the solve. Incredible reduction. What else can we do? Some of you might be thinking that this part is symmetric down its center axis, and that might be a valid assumption. In this case, we don't make that assumption because the mass of the lamp itself is not symmetric across that plane. Now, it could be considered that the, the asymmetry in the lamp is small enough that it is not of concern, and so we could cut this part in half using a symmetry constraint. In this case, though, we make an even more, a slightly more radical assumption, but in this case, still a valid one, and say that if we think about a beam profile from our engineering classes, our statics classes, right? Just gave you a little preview there. The force that transmits up through this bolt feature must transition through this cross section, right? So any force that goes to ground here must come from this force through this section. So what we can do is actually section this part further. Further reducing the complexity, further decreasing the solve time, and keeping the accuracy of our specific question while sacrificing accuracy in other areas. All right. So I've got this remote mass. It's one part. It's only partially connected. In this case, we're just going to go ahead and run the simulation. I normally wouldn't dream of doing this in front of you live, but since this is so fast, we can do it, right? 3.79, 7.5, right, or excuse me, 3.75 megapascals. This is still consistent with our original results, which means that our assumption, in this case, you know, maybe it's a little low, so maybe we need to cut it a little higher, something like that, right? But now, if we take a look at our results, we can take a look at the, we can right click on the mesh and look at the details and see that the mesh itself reports in as being only 5,300 or so nodes. Much smaller than our 80,000 nodes start with and it solves in fractions of a second. The overall solver itself, if you come to the solver messages, solves in two seconds, all right? This is the stage at which I've found that I've made a proper assumption of the exact situation of the problem, right? I'm asking a very specific question. What is the stress state of this fillet? And because of that, I've vastly reduced my solve time. So I can analyze this question, make changes, resolve it, do whatever I need to do, and then zoom back out to the overall assembly and make another question and zoom back in, right? You're still going to save time over solving the entire thing. And furthermore, if you're using these mesh constraints, right, what you're going to want to do is once you find this ideal setup, then you're going to want to increase the mesh density by creating a new mesh or a new study and increasing the density, which will increase the accuracy somewhat. All right. Now, it's an asymptotic approach to whatever the value is. 
So at a certain point, again, that 5 to 10 percent value that I talked about before is kind of the golden rule. So as you change the mesh values, you're going to notice that the value here is going to change just a little bit. And actually that's a good thing to know for any FEA solver. Every time you resolve the mesh, the answer is going to be a little bit different just because of the discretization of the model. However, as long as we maintain a relatively close accuracy, a couple of percent, we consider that answer converged. Right? So I could run this mesh detail up. I could right click on the study itself and change its properties to allow for an adaptive mesh, right? which refines the mesh in certain locations where it detects high levels of stress or inaccuracy. And all of these are ways of making sure that we have the correct answer. By the way, the question I asked earlier was what information are we sacrificing to get this speed of this result? The overall displacement of the part in this simulation is accurate, but it is only the displacement with respect, with respect to this cut plane, not the overall simulation. We lost flexibility in the displacement results because we took out the hanger, we took out the bar, we took out those rod ends, all right? But again, our question was not about the displacement, it was about the stress. So you have to ask a really specific question of your software. Right? And in this case, the original setup for this solves in one second, meshes in less than a second. This is iterations faster than you can think of changes, right? And what this allows you to do is really highly refine your model. All right. And as we can see here, just like I said, it's an asymptotic approach to the answers. In the same fashion, it's an asymptotic approach to a solve time, right? Our initial assumption of simply removing the most complicated piece of geometry was easily the best choice we made, right? Removed a huge amount of computational elements of the nodes, right? And of solve time. We can see here on the two graphs. And as we go along, the more aggressive we get with our simplifications, it does get faster, but not that much. So maybe if you have a small part like this, there is no need to go into that level of detail right, in simplifications. But at a large scale, that could be the difference between days, hours, and minutes. And here's the holy grail. Our results are well within 10% of each other. right? So we can assume that our assumptions were correct in this case. In general, there's sort of a, almost a fallacy that more time equals more accuracy in a simulation. But we want to work smarter, not harder, right? So it is true that once we get down to the f much reduced problem, the more time we spend on it, the greater accuracy we're going to get. But that is still less time by a long margin than trying to solve the entire simulation all at once, right? So hopefully this has given you some, some tips to be able to use SOLIDWORKS simulation more effectively and quickly. As always, if you have any questions for us, please go ahead and contact support at mcad.com or give us a call. Um, and as always, you know, keep enjoying the software and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, bye.